you know, sometimes when you're a parent, you don't know if you're like really making an impact, right? Because you, you, you put yourself on such a high standard that don't, not even God puts us in that standard. So I appreciate what our kids said and um, thank you for your words. Um, well, today I get to share the pulpit with my husband. Uh, thank you for timing me. Uh, so I want you to go to James 4, 7 already and park yourselves there. But I believe that, you know, it's time for us to reflect. I, I believe the message that I'm going to share with you this morning is it's whether you are a mom, a dad, or, you know, you have children, don't have children. And uh, if you're breathing, this message is for you. Because many times we avoid family conference because we're like, you know, I'm not married or, you know, I'm not interested in getting married. I don't have children. I don't want children. But I'm here to tell you that you are someone, someone's child. You are, belong to someone's family. But even if, you, if maybe you're, you didn't grow up or maybe you don't have the family that you always desire, I'm going to tell you that you have someone who loves you and you do belong. You belong to the family of God. And this is us. And it's beautiful to see us, as broken as we are, that there is a God who loves us for who we are because he sees us through the eyes of Jesus. And that alone makes us belong into a belonging family. So let us go to James 4, 7. And he says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. And when I'm reading this, let me just tell you that the word here, James, is not talking to the world. He's not talking to people that were not Christians. He's talking to Christians. So he says we not only need to submit, but we have, we have to come to a point in our lives that, you know, we have to recognize that we have sin, that we need to wash our hands, that we need to purify our hearts. And he says you double-minded because we change our minds about God constantly, right? And I'm not the only one. One moment he's for us, one another moment we don't know if he's for us. Well, he is for us. Uh, it says, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I believe that this message uh, today is to realize that God is, is he's not disappointed about your life. He might not agree with it, you know, but our God in his nature, he doesn't have disappointment. Our God, the nature of God is love. The nature of God is comfort. The nature of God is to believe. He designed us already to overcome. He designed us to be a family. He designed so much to have a family that he created us. He created us for a connection. He created us to, to uh, show, like, this is, this is our God. This is who we are. We are the children of the Most High God. And many times, I don't know about you, but many times we identify ourselves. If you're married, you identify yourself as a husband. And when people get divorced, it's such a loss, and they don't know what to do because their, their identity was placed on their spouse. You know, we have children, our children, we, we still, I still call my children my babies, but they're not babies. But I remember when my daughter went to college, and as a mother, I was like, what do I do now? Like, she's gone, and Isaac, I remember Isaac pulling me out of my bed, and out of her bed, actually, because I was hugging her bed, and I like, Isaac says, you still have another child. <laughs> you know, but I was, <laughs> he brought me back, oh yeah, you're right, you're right. But, but it's so easily, you don't even see those things, but we identify, you know, as parents, and, and if we don't have the children, then we don't know what to do. You know that there's a lot of marriages that dissolve after the kids go to college because everything was based on the kids. You know, we lived for the kids. We live, you know, and then you live so much for the kids that when they, when they leave, you die for your kids. And, and that's upside down right but you can identify yourself as a single you're single and then you know I'm, I'm forever gonna be single God hasn't sent me my mate and and let's pray and we can be so focused on all of those things and those things are important but the most important things is that you and I identify ourselves as a child of God 
that when you don't feel that, when you feel that you're the loneliest, you know what? Yeah, you might feel lonely, but you're not alone. You belong. And it's, and it's so easy. You know, I, I always say, you know, we, we think that we have all these prayers that are so profound, right? We, the Bible says, submit yourself. That means to yield your own self, that you make a choice. And I'm going to say, I'm going to yield my thinking. I'm going to yield how I'm feeling. I'm going to yield my own uh, hurt or whatever it is. I'm going to yield myself willingly to God. And I'm going to address my own thing. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to recognize that I have sin. I'm going to recognize that, you know, that I need to wash my hands because I have allowed myself to get the things of life to get me in a bad place. But we usually, in our prayers, I usually submit everything else to God but me. If you're married, you're probably always submitting your spouse to God. Let's be just, let's be honest. How many times have you submitted your spouse to God? Lord, I yield them to you. Of course, why don't you yield yourself, right? I yield my children to you. We yield a lot of things, and yet we don't. Because the idea of yielding is really awesome. But yielding means that you choose to submit what you don't see, what you don't feel, and you need to trust God in the process that he has you. If we want to fix our marriages, our children, your business, it's not fixing the outward, it's fixing it within. You know, we need to submit ourselves to yield. I think we're living in times, you know, that um, families, uh, you know, families are disintegrating. It's like... A lot of people don't even get married because they don't, see, they don't see an example of what a marriage should look like. Maybe because they didn't see it in their home. Maybe because they don't see it anywhere. And so you and I have been commanded. You and I, God has placed us on this earth to, rep- to represent him. My family represents Jesus. Your family represents Jesus. You yourself, whether you're married or not, you represent Jesus if he is your Lord and Savior. But many times we don't see the promises of God and we can be in a bad place because we put everything on God. Like, God, what happened? I've been praying for for my life. I've been praying for my mate to come. I've been praying for my children. Nothing is changing. And I'm going to tell you that it's not that God is not... It's not... um, but what I said is not answering prayer is that we refuse to yield. We refuse to submit. And I, I, I believe that we're living in times that people are just looking for someone, it, for someone to, to show the way. You know, it makes me sad to know all the statistics about the church. And when I said the church, it's anyone who claims to be a believer. You don't have to belong to a church because many of us proclaim to be Christians, right? You hear it all the time. The Bible, the, I mean, the news talk about Christians. But just because we say a, I'm a Christian, that doesn't mean you're a follower of Jesus Christ. But when they do the statistics about how the church is doing, and, you know, it's all of our children right now, when I say all of our children, it's according to their stats, right? They're saying that the church is more dysfunctional than the world. They're saying that uh, divorce is higher than the world. And so what is the difference between you and I? And I believe it's because we refuse to yield those things to God. You know, our kids, uh, uh, because we, we love faith, the Bible says that the just should live by faith. If we can put uh, my, my scripture, please, my second scripture. This is what it says. It's Habakkuk 2.4. Look at the proud one. His soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith in the true God. We talk a lot about faith. But faith without works is dead. It is almost, and it is, I'm going to say, it's impossible to walk by faith if we don't do that works part because it's dead, right? But the works part comes on the soul. And I'm so glad I can hear all of you asking me, what's the soul? What's the soul? (laughs) Thank you for asking me. The soul means 
and this is in the Hebrew, right? And remember, Jesus quoted this scripture. Or was it Jesus or was one of his disciples? He quoted, the just shall live by faith. Right? He was quoting Habakkuk. Proud means presume. You presume to be someone that you're not. You know, when it comes to family, we love to presume, right? Because we want to look great. You know, we tell our kids, you better behave because if that misbehave, they're, they're representing me. I'm not worried about the kids. I'm worried about me. What are people going to say? What are people going to say because that reflects me? You better behave when we go over there. You better, if they offer you food, I don't say that you're hungry. I grew up that way, like, but I'm hungry. No, you're going to say that you're not hungry. <laughs> and then they would offer some, you know, some, some sweets. And I remember being little and like, D would you like some sweets? And no, thank you. And then my stomach is speaking for me, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. right? Because why? Because we needed to portray, to presume this family that we were not. And maybe it's not in that way right now, but maybe in our times that we're living is that we don't like our kids to, you know, to, to whine, right? We don't want our kids to complain. We want our kids to be perfect because, hey, I'm a perfect parent. Who's a perfect parent? No one but God. He says that he will perfect all those things that concern us. So... I believe that we're living in times where our kids, and as parents, I know I said this is more about all of us, but, but even give yourself, even give yourself to, give yourself permission to feel. Do you know that there's nothing wrong with feeling? That's why we have a soul. A soul, I know that you asked me, I heard that question again, is the person of individual. That's who your soul is. The inner being of a man. The seed of all emotions, activity of the mind, activity of the will, activity of the character, the sums up your soul. And so we think that by being a Christian is just we just are going to walk in the spirit. Well, our spirit men, when we come to Jesus, that's saved. But he says that our soul needs to be right with God in order to walk in faith. And I believe that God wants to expose. You know that God, whenever God wants to expose something, it's not to shame us. God will never, I don't believe that uh, God will send here a prophet or, or somebody to say, you know what, let me tell you, this is what you've been doing. How did you do that and, and expose you so the whole entire world can see what you've been doing? Do you know that that's not God? That's never God because God is not a gossiper. God will talk to you first. God will, will deal with you first. And even if you don't listen, he will deal again with you. And it can be years. And that's why we never see the greatness of, of what we can do in God. And it's not because God is not great. It's because we do not allow him to work in our lives. And I believe that it's time for us to give access to God, to not to be afraid. You know what? It's time for us to bring everything unto God to yield not only myself because I believe that if I yield myself and it's and it's proven whenever I have decided to yield myself to God and say you know God I'm gonna yield my will to you I'm gonna yield my emotions to you I'm gonna yield my thinking to you the more I do that the better I get with the other people around me the more I do that, whether you come from a, you know, because not everybody comes from a, from a bad family or dysfunctionality. Some people do, but others come with, you know, it was great. The parents were a little bit cray cray, but it was good. You know, but, but it's okay. Because God is not betting on what happened to us, but he's betting that we will come and we will say and we recognize that we are a part of his family. And that it's never too late for us to start. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that I know for a fact that the most, the moment we, we submit ourselves, our own selves to our God, that's the moment that you start seeing things in a different way. I love what Angela says. The first time that she came, she's like, oh, my God, this is a bunch of Mexicans. 
where's Angela? She's not here. She's out. But she was wrong. Oh, yes. Because you know I'm not Mexican. <laughs> I'm not Mexican. But hey, I take it as a compliment. I love my Mexican people. Can't live without their food. But it's funny. But you know, I, I believe this is, well, when we pray for our church, this is, I, we are seeing after nine years or ten years of prayer before we came to do this church, we are seeing the promises of God right now. When we pray, we said, Lord, if we're going to do this for you, we don't want to be just us. We want every nation in this house. We wanted to be a family that belong. We're not going to be segregated people. You know, we want every color, every nation, every kid to come here and to, and to see what a family looks like. Because in heaven, there's not going to be Caucasians in these sections and African-Americans in these sections and Africans and Africans on this section, the Hispanics on this section. No, there's going to be a mesh of beautiful families. Yes. Right? So props to you, Angela, because you know what? She decided to submit her will to God and say, you know what? Okay, then let me go see. And sometimes that's all it takes. Okay, I have three minutes. I'm counting my time, so you know, because I'm sharing with my husband. And he's already looking at me. No, I'm still in my time, 324. <laughs> many times we're not interested in how our children are doing in, we're, I'm sorry, many times we're so much interested in how our children are doing in their grace than their emotional quotient. You know, our kids are not allowed to feel. They come home and they were sad. Why are you sad? I didn't have a good day. And sometimes we don't even allow them to respond because we're Christians. We are not, we should not be sad. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Can you imagine if God would do that to us? Imagine if we come to, to God and we're like, Lord, you know, because we all do it, right? I don't know if you complain to God because not all of them are prayers. Some of them are complainings, right? And then we come to God and we're in, and just, just imagine. I come to God and I said, Lord, I just had a bad day. You know, these people, and I start naming people, they hurt me, Lord. And then I, he wouldn't let me speak. He was just, Stop it, Virginia. I give you my son, Jesus. He died for you on the cross. You have no, you have no right to be complaining to me. You have no right to feel. You know, get it together, girl. <laughs> I call you to live by faith. I don't want to, I'm here in sight right now. How many times has God responded like that to you? Even if you were so off, never. And what is it that we don't allow ourselves, our children, and people to just come? I'm not saying live there, but there's nothing wrong with feeling. Actually, be, feeling is the beginning of healing. Did you know that? But because we have it all confused. My prayer is that in this family conference that you will realize that there's many things that need to be exposed within you. That you will realize that it's time to submit yourself whether you're going through any troubles in your family, business, or career, that you submit yourself to God and let him guide you and lead you. Okay, I still had a minute, but. Great job. Awesome, awesome. If you weren't here for the uh, kickoff of the conference in, uh, on Wednesday and Thursday, please go to uh, YouTube and, and watch it. Let me tell you something. We hit just about every topic. We hit divorce. We hit marriage, we hit singles, uh, widow, and uh, so make sure you, you go and watch it. And today my wife and I wanted to, you know, talk a little bit more open, more general. I'm going to talk about just parenting for a second, and whether you're uh, married, divorced, a foster parent, single, this applies to every single one of us. And I want you to listen to this because, you know what, you may be someone that's already a grandparent, but guess what, you are a grandparent. You can still parent grandchildren. And so this applies to every single one of us. And most importantly, because we're God's children. 
And we understand that uh, we all have a little bit of dysfunction in us, every single one of us. Uh, but how many know that we have a Heavenly Father that knows how to take care of that? He knows how to handle that with us. But how many know that it takes, it, it takes not only faith, but it takes a lot of work to raise up a family? How many honestly believe that? I mean, yeah, I got the faith part. And I think sometimes we can be so faith-driven that we forget that there's works that have to apply with our faith. Look at James chapter 2, verse 18 through 20 quickly. It says, but someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God? That's awesome. Even the demons believe that, and they tremble. Isn't it amazing how Satan and all his demons tremble at the name of Jesus? It's almost like demons have more of a fear of God than most Christians do. Look at it, look, look what it says, but verse 20 says, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is? Yes. Come on, too many of us are so good at looking at our family problems, marriage problems, single problems. We look at our children problems. We look at our financial problems. We are so good. I think we're experts when it comes to looking at our problems and you know one thing i've noticed as people in general that we suck at solving problems <laughs> yes or no yes. all right so when i was a kid i sucked at math how many were not good at math okay it was bad man i'm not kidding you it was really bad and i remember when i would be sitting at the desk taking a test and they are you know, there's a variety of different types of math, fractions, multiplication, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of algebra, a little bit of everything, right? Geometry. But there was this one that really was annoying, and it was the one that said, find the X. Do you guys remember find the X? And you're just like, who gives a rip about the X? Like, you know, and so when, when all I did was sit there at the desk, I'm like, find the x find the i'm like what does that even mean like can you guys finish the sentence at least like like you know what's the process and 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 so anyway so i sat there and i said okay well let me see if i can solve this problem and this is what i did watch right here boom i said okay here it is and i circled the x i'm like that was so stupid like you guys really don't know how to find the x it's right here right and don't ask me why <laughs> i'm not gonna help you find any more things but listen, here's the truth. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. We're so great at looking at the problem, scratching our head, because we know that we can't solve the problem. And the reality is this, is that the only equation to every single one of our problems is Jesus. We have to get back to the word governing our family life. We have to get back to the word governing and how we parent we have to get back to the word of God to govern how you're going to live your single life we have to get back to this and so I love this you guys can take that away now <laughs> so say Jesus is the equation so let me give you the quick here's the here's the formula for faith the formula for faith when you're looking at a problem is this if I believe what he says I will do what he said that's the formula of faith. If I, because there's a lot of people that say, yeah, I believe God. Yeah, you believe God until you have to believe God. Right? So many of us, we, we read the Bible like, amen. Get a lot of amens. Okay. But when does that amen turn into works? Because how many know that God's word became flesh? God wants his word to come alive in us. It's already alive. The Bible is living and active, but God wants to activate that in us. And the only way you activate that is by your works. There has to be an application. There must be a multiplication. And so I get it. But let me show you what our challenge today as people are, whether we're married, divorced, single, whatever. Here we go. Ready? Very good. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. And you better watch it when you go to the book of Judges because you're about to be judged. It says, in those days, ever say in those days? And those days apply to these days. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Ever say no king? So in other words, there was no one governing. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In other words, 
You take the scripture and what God is saying to us, the church, the family, the marrieds, the singles, is so often we take the king off the throne of our life. We dethrone the king. And, and the Bible says that there was no king in Israel. And so everybody did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And how many know many of us, our lenses are broken. And we see God in a, in a very wrong light. We see God in a way that we can't perceive the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, like Angela was sharing in her story. And by the way, the Mexican she was talking about was right here. I'm the Mexican. But, uh, but I'm telling you, God wants us to get that restored. But the only way to get yourself, your family, your marriage, your single life back on track is to get the king back on the throne of your heart. Because if not, you'll just keep doing things your way. And so, you know what? People started doing what they saw fit for their life. But I want you to know that the quickest way to fail as a family is to do whatever you want to do. That's the quickest way to fail as a family. Do what you want to do. Keep doing what you desire to do. Keep doing what you choose to do. And tell me how that works for you. That's what God is saying to us. We need the king back in our life. I don't know about you, but how many remember Chips Ahoy? Remember this? This is awesome because when you think about Chips Ahoy, when I was a kid, I used to love this. Not even as a kid, even as a grown adult, I would eat. I would tear up the whole thing in one sitting. I don't do it anymore, but I used to because I'm getting older now. Um, but when you think about Chips Ahoy, it's a great cookie. And when you think about the factory of Chips Ahoy, I'm sure when they first, when they first created the cookie in the factory, I'm sure it was perfect. It was wonderful. I mean, the packaging is so enticing too, right? You just look at the picture of the cookie in the package, and you want to tear that thing up like nobody's business, right? And so it looked wonderful. But check this out. That thing, that cookie, that package went through a process, a system. It went through so many machinery where it eventually got into the hands of man. And then man, the employees started holding it, packing it, putting it on pallets. And then from there it went into a big old truck. And then that truck started driving that thing back to uh, different stores. And now you had other employees in the, in the supermarket touching it, grabbing it, putting it on the display. Then you had the wonderful customers who would go and pick up these packages and oopsie, drops the package. And then before you know it, this Wonderful Chips Ahoy has been through so much. And one thing that has always, it has, last night I bought this. I kind of ripped this one up earlier. But last night I bought this one, and it never fails. There's, the cookies are there. But what I have found is that there's a lot of crumbs inside this package. Have you noticed that? Now, don't get it twisted, man. I will eat all the good cookies first, but I'm going to tear up those crumbs as well. <laughs> I'm going to tear it up. Why, what, what, why, why the cookie, Pastor? Because let me tell you something, just the way the cookie crumbles is just the way sometimes family crumble too. See, when you first have your child, they're beautiful. They're innocent. They could never do no wrong. Man, they are perfect. You look at them and you're like, man, you are like the pride and joy of heaven and earth, right? We look at our, then they grow up and you're like, what the heck? <laughs> what happened to you? You ugly. Man, you're, you're mean. Like you used to be sweet one day. You know what? And, and what happens is, is this. It's called life happens. Our children go through the hands of different people in the school system, family members, relationships, married, listen, parents. And then all of a sudden, life and life, we start experiencing all kinds of hurt and all kinds of pain and all kinds of destructive behavior. And you start summing up all these different things. No wonder why the cookie crumbles. But how many know that we serve a God who knows how to put the cookie back? Amen? Anybody want a cookie? I'm going to eat these later. Don't worry about that. Are you guys getting this? So, so we've all had this, this, this issue with this dysfunction because we've all, listen, and, and it's not just about our children. Guess what? You and I, we're kids. We're children too. God created us perfect, then sin came in and then crumbled us up, messed us up, got us dysfunctional. However, we can't raise children 
in this culture, and I love what my wife said, you can't blame the culture for your, your kids' dysfunction. You can't bra uh, uh, blame the media or social media. You can't blame anybody for your children but yourself. We have to take personal responsibility while they're children. Once they're adults, it's on them now, right? You've done what you can. But I think what happens is we so often we see parents today are raising children by accident and not by intentionality. Now, let me give you the definition of accident, okay? The definition of an accident is this. An event that happens by chance or that is without a parent. Give it a 1A. A parent. This is the Webster di the Dictionary uh, uh, definition, by the way. I didn't come up. I wasn't being clever. It says it's without a parent or deliberate cause. In other words, when we are not intentional, there are going to be accidents as we're raising our children. We must be intentional as mothers and fathers, as grandparents, as uncles and aunts. We should be intentional when it comes even to the children of this church. Do you realize that we have over 200 children and youth in this church? Now, mind you, those are I'm not even counting the inconsistent children. And it's not because the kids ain't coming. It's because the parents ain't bringing them. We rewind that. It ain't because the kids ain't coming. It's because the parents ain't bringing them. 200 plus kids come here every single week with families that are consistent. If you were to add all the numbers, it's way more than that. It's a lot of kids. But you got a lot of families that come once a month, you know, once every other week, once every other month. Or they only, they only come when they're in trouble. And, and God, thank God bless the church that we have a place where people can run to when they're in trouble. Amen. So there ain't no shame in that game either. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. But we only get one shot raising our kids, guys. You only get one shot. There's no, there's no repeats. There's no redos. There's no resets. Once you've raised your child, that's your child. And you got to accept that. But I'm glad that God loves our children, and God does not shame us. God does not put a guilt trip on us because I know that there may be parents here that already have kids that are young adults. Like, I got young adults, okay? They're already grown up and everything, but I can say that my wife and I, do we have some regrets? Yes, we do have some regrets. We can't change our past, but we can change the future. You know what I'm saying? And so I don't want you to feel any shame as a parent. If maybe you did not apply a lot of these things what I'm sharing, God will grace you through the next season of your life with your grandchildren. Amen? Okay, so uh, we have to be intentional parents. We have to be intentional single people. We have to be intentional married people. We have to be intentional divorcees too. You got to be intentional because you can live in that place of just complete brokenness that you got divorced and then you live there for the rest of your life. No, God wants to go ahead and he wants to catapult you to the next season of your life. God wants to shift you to another place of joy, amen? But we have to be intentional. And so I just want to leave you with that real quick. Let's move on here. Let's go to Psalms 127 because I want you to know that God, God is the creator of family. It was God's big idea to have family. It wasn't the world's idea. Marriage was God's idea. Family was God's idea. It was all his idea. So we know that God cares about family. Look at what Psalms 127 verse 1 through 5 says. He says, if the Lord doesn't build a house, the work of the builders, everybody say, I'm a builder. Look at this. So unless the Lord builds the house, the work of the builders is useless. If the Lord doesn't watch over a city, it's useless for those who guard duty and stand over it. And I can say, that has been me as a parent. That's one regret that I'm still working on. I'm overprotective. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a helicopter. Where are you going? Where's the end? Give me the address. Who are you going to be with? And what time are you coming home? Like helicopter, like nobody's business. And I think, you know, I think there's some wisdom in that. But when you're a little bit dysfunctional about it, you know, when you're worried, when you're stressed, when, when, when you can't even be at peace at home because you're thinking, I wonder if my child, I wonder if something happened to my child, I wonder if my kid's in an accident, that's dysfunctional. That's unhealthy. And that, that happens to a lot of us parents. But here God's saying, it's useless, Mauricio. 
You're worried for nothing. See, unless I build your house, unless I build up your faith, your trust, unless you know that I got your kids, you're useless. You're wasting time because at the end of the day, they come back home, they're safe, it's wonderful, and I wasted all that time being worried knowing that God had them. Amen? Ever say it's useless. Let's keep going. It's useless for you to work from early morning. You all better not quit your job. <laughs> Until late at night just to get food to eat. God provides for those he loves even while they sleep. Yeah. Man, you're worried. Oh, I'm going to pay the bills. Oh, gonna... did, it, did it help you? Did it pay the bills? <laughs> did it do? No. God's saying, I want to train you as my children. Every single one of you, you are a child of God. I'm trying to train God saying, I want you to know that I will provide for you in your sleep. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children who are born to people when they are young are like what? Arrows in the what? Hands of a soldier. Guess what, mom, dad? You're a soldier. Guess what, singles? One day when you want kids, when you have kids, you're going to be a soldier and your children will be an arrow. This is what an arrow looks like quickly. Put that arrow up. Let me just show you a few things. Notice that these are called the feathers. This is the shaft. And we know that this sharp end is the pointer, the, the penetrate, the arrow that's going to penetrate whatever you're going to hit. I want you to know something. Notice how God uses an arrow as an illustration when he talks about your children. He uses an arrow because he needs you to understand that we have to prepare an arrow. We have to create an arrow in order for us to launch them into destiny. That, that pointy part right here, the arrow right here, that thing is sharp. It needs to be sharp because if it's going to not only reach its target, it needs to penetrate its target. We need to sharpen our children in Jesus. We need to sharpen their biblical skills, their spiritual skills. We need to sharpen them in their emotional stability. We need to sharpen them in, in, in faith, in love, in hope, in knowing that Jesus is the anchor. But the only way they can get sharpened is by how you sharpen them. Now think about this. Then there's the shaft. Well, let me tell you something. If the shaft is crooked, what's going to happen? It's going to do some crazy stuff. Do you know that we have a responsibility to correct all the curves, the dents, and everything on that shaft? In other words, we as parents have a responsibility to correct our children so that they can go straight with God. Amen? That's why God says, I make straight crooked places. How about the feather? You know what the feather does? The purpose of a feather on an arrow is for the stability of the arrow in order for it to reach its destination without going off the path. We need to get the feathers on our children, our grandchildren, our children at church. Listen, they may not be your children in that, in that building in there right now, in that building over there. But like Angela said, she's like, I just want to know that my children are in an environment where they're going to be praised, encouraged, even corrected, but instructed and loved and appreciated and pushed forward so that they can see that God loves them. Amen? So it's not just about your kids. It's about our kids because this is us. Let's finish the, 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 the scripture, and then I got three points. Blessed are those who have many children. All right. For all my Mexicans. <laughs> they won't be put to shame when they go up against their enemies in court. In other words, we're preparing them because they're going to face some enemies. They're going to face some pushback. They're going to face some challenges. In other, in other words, unless we have God's blueprint for family, we are not going to build a house up to code for God. God needs the house to be up to code. That is our responsibility. And I'm not talking about a physical structure. I'm talking about a spiritual, emotional, psychological, healthy structure for God. Amen? That's what God wants for us. And I know that what happens with family is that they build all the wrong things. Now, no shame, okay? But here's what I see a lot with families today. They start building families with Band-Aids. What are Band-Aids? Vacations, sports, entertainment, recreation. Nothing wrong with all that. 
Nothing wrong with that. But let me tell you something. Sports, recreation, entertainment, vacations, they're not going to build character, moral stability, values, principles, faith, or even a love for God. Those are things that we just do to go out and have fun as a family. And we have to realize that. And listen, if you don't start now, later on you'll pay for it with a lot of, a lot of hurt. We can't fix our children and prep them for battle at the same time if that's how we're fixing our family problems. Most families that have problems always say this, let's go on a vacation as if the vacation is going to heal it. Let's buy a car. We become impulsive. Let me buy you a car. And we become these impulsive people. We need to be the kind of people that are allowing the Lord to build the house with us. Not being busy. Look at Proverbs 24, 3. And verse 4 says, By wisdom a house is built. Through understanding it is made secure. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with priceless and beautiful things. We need the wisdom of God. We need the knowledge of God. We need the understanding of God. You see, you can't think that just because you're sitting in a church chair or because you own a Bible at home that you're building anything for God. No, 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 no. Faith without works. What does what the verse say? Oh, foolish man. Or woman, because, you know, we're keeping it like, you know, everybody's in this. Faith without works is what? It's dead. It's dead. You can't, you can't even begin to proclaim all those things, but you're dead. There's no activity. It's got to be Jesus, amen? Let me give you these three types of parents. Quick, quick, quick. We're running out of time. Three types of parents. You ready? Number one, there's the authoritarian parenting. Okay? That one is, uh, you better do that or else. Let me see all those parents real quick, man. You're just like, man, if, si no levantas tu ropa, vas a ver, right? You're one of those. <laughs> you know, my mom was the chancla, right? She just. I will spank you. But it's the, the authoritative parent always says, if you don't do this, if you don't do that, you know it, or else. Or we've said things like, man, if you don't do that, listen, I brought you into this world. I will take you out of this world, and I'll create another one just like you, and he or she will be better. We become so authoritative in our parenting that we become so destructive, and it just becomes a threat, but it's all external obedience, not internal obedience. See, we want to we want to train hearts. That's what we want to do as parents. We want to we want to address the heart issue, a healthy heart. Number two, second type of parent is the permissive parenting. That means anything goes. You're always affirming them, affirming them, affirming. Always encouragement, encouragement. You know that you have, you know, you know, little Sally and and, and little Juanito over there. They're they're crying at the at the supermarket. <laughs> and mom or dad are like, oh, it's okay, it's okay, honey. Hey, what, what's going on with your kid? Oh, they just didn't sleep enough. But they're 17 years old. What the heck? Are you kidding me? That's a 17 year on the floor. It's the parent that's just kind of like, just yeah, it, it's okay. They didn't get enough sleep. Oh, they just had, you know, Samantha had a bad day, you know. You know, we, we come up with these excuses and we think that we're helping them. No. No, we have to correct whom the Lord loves, he rebukes. Whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Whom the Lord loves, he instructs. And whom the Lord loves, he loves you back to life again but we got this passiveness of parenting it's sad parents that don't tell their children no and you know what i don't like i can tell a lot and it's not the kids i don't hate on the kids but you know what bothers me is when i see a disrespectful kid like i be like hey hi how you doing and they're just like well, that's your mom right there man I, now i know listen our children are a reflection of our parenting because my kids they've been taught to respect to love to honor to go out of their way to serve people it's not listen it wasn't an option it wasn't a suggestion it's who we are this is us you're going to love you're going to respect you're going to greet you're going to look people in the eye i tell my kids when people talk to you look them in the eye you never do this no, you look them in the eye. You show them confidence. You show them you know your, your identity in Christ Jesus. You, you know who you are, amen? 
So we have to, and then we reward, we, we reward their misbehavior. Okay, Billy, here, just, just play with the iPad. <laughs> Permissive. iPad is taking care of our children today. Video games are, okay, all right, just, just order pizza and go to your room, play games. Permissive. Teach your kids no. Number three, quickly. Y'all looking upset at me. Here we go. <laughs> Getting some stink eyes. Biblical parenting. Biblical parenting trains the heart. Biblical parenting is what brings in understanding. Listen, here's the reality. We have a job to do. We have to invest values into our children. You must invest values. We have to, let me give you a few of them. Biblical parenting is training them for life. That's what this is. Look, train them to have a good relationship with God. Train them how to deal with healthy confrontation. Train them in how to forgive and love people. Train them in how to overcome life's challenges so they are not depressed later. Okay? If your kids come, and this is, I know this is a hard one for a lot of us, because I'm not a very feely guy. I'm not. I'm not a feely guy. So that has been something that I've had to work on, even to understand my own children when they feel a certain way. You know what I'm saying? But we have to train them not to become depressed. We have to train them how to live by faith. We have to train them to trust God in every season. We have to train them to be the best at everything they do. Your children should be the best of the best of the best. Not perfect, but excellent. Always, always wanting more from God. We got to train our children. Isn't that what the Bible says in Psalms? It says train up a child in the way they should go so as they grow old, they won't depart from God. But we got more parents departing from God than children. We got children that are begging parents, take me to church. Are you hearing me today? We got to wake up, church, all of us. We got to wake up. Because our, listen, our children are a product of us. They're a product of us. There's only one verse I was looking in the Bible. Like, because Jesus used to be a kid, right? Right? He used to be a baby. He was adolescent, teenager. I wonder how his parents raised him. And I looked throughout the Bible. There's only one verse I found. Look at Luke. Luke chapter 2, verse 15. It says, and Jesus what? Grew in the what? Wisdom. And the what? Stature. And in what? Favor with God. And with who? I want my kids to grow in wisdom. I want my kids to grow in stature, and I want them to not only have the favor of God, I want them to have the favor of man. Amen? If this was good for Jesus, <laughs> parents, Mary and Joseph, this is how they raised him. They raised him biblically. It wasn't just because he's the, you know, the son of God, like he already, no. We're here to build our children in the ways of God. We're here to train them. Amen? Let's give the Lord a big hand clap. <laughs> Bow your head, close your eyes. I hope you got something out of this today. Father, we thank you so much as we sit in this sanctuary. I thank you that, Lord, we can all reflect whether we're still parenting little ones, Father, or teenagers, or whether we're grandparents, or whether we're uncles or aunts. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand the value of raising an army of arrows, Father. Not only our own children, but, Father, our grandchildren, the children of our church. Lord, give us a deep conviction not just to be church attenders, but that we would be people of faith, that we are taking the responsibility of this next generation of our future leaders, that we're owning the fact that these children need models. They need mentors. They need people that they can follow. Father, I pray that you would help us to be that, not only in our family, but everywhere we go. I pray that you would grace us, that you would heal our hearts, that you would restore any relationship between maybe a dysfunctional relationship between a mom and a father or daughter. I pray for healing in the family, God. We thank you that you who has begun the good work, you're going to finish this work in us, God. I thank you that, Lord, you will grace us, equip us, train us, and most importantly, we have your Holy Spirit that comforts us. I pray for redemption, Father, for any children that may have steered away, Father. I pray that your holy presence would bring them back. 
just like the prodigal son, Father, they came to their senses. 